There's so much talk about EVs being dearer to buy than ICE and public EV charging prices making EVs dearer to run than petrol that we totally overlook sometimes the environmental and societal impacts of EVs versus ICE. Not everybody buys or leases an EV purely to save money on the running costs. I'm Dave and I'll take on the underreported but no less vital benefits that driving EV has already brought and where we're heading from here. So let's drop back 20 years and realise that there were no EVs on the roads. A few of them were being trialled, but there were no production models off for sale, none in the dealers. No Leafs, no Zoes, no Teslas. It was fossil fuel all the way on the roads back then. And after a hundred years of auto manufacturing, there was zero appetite for change. They had it off pat. Nobody was looking for a change. What we had worked, sort of. Now, our grid back then was largely fossil fuel, coal, oil and gas, some nuclear, some hydro, but mainly fossil fuel driven. Our homes were almost entirely fossil fuel. Heating was by burning natural gas, central heating. Industry almost exclusively fossil fuels. Our cars, lorries and buses were 100% petrol, diesel or LPG. Neither homes nor industry were gearing up for a change anytime soon. In fact, oil and gas exploration was still increasing, along with ever more efficient methods for getting oil out of the ground. And then along came the paradigm shift. The startup company, Tesla, was taken over by a new CEO, whose mission statement simply said to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Oh, really simple. So how's that gone? <laughs> well, Tesla knew a simple truth. Many people are unlikely to purchase a product because it has low lifetime emissions. For mass adoption, our products need to be better than their alternatives in every way. More affordable, safer, more fun. We're not just trying to build sustainable products, we are committed to building the best products, full stop. We offer our owners a full ecosystem of products and services to ensure that they have the best experience possible, from purchase to delivery, from charging to servicing. So let's have a look how they've done. Well, in 2024, Tesla customers, between them, avoided releasing nearly 32 million metric tonnes of carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere. That was an increase of 60% since 2023. And that number is growing far faster with increases in efficiency, autonomy and ever more EVs on the road. And the Giga Berlin factory has operated on 100% renewable energy for the last two years. On the minor side, each year 8 million people worldwide die prematurely from the pollution caused by burning fossil fuels. Now let's cover one myth. It is true that an EV produces more CO2 and emissions during manufacturing. It's about twice as much. But manufacturing is only a tiny part of the vehicle's lifetime emissions. While charging an EV still uses some grid electricity, no grid's 100% green at the moment, so even EVs produce some emissions during their lifetime, although this figure is reducing rapidly year on year. In contrast, the emissions from burning fossil fuels from cars are much greater, and they're not reducing. In fact, they're actually going up. Now, if you add in the emissions produced by driving each vehicle, then an ICE vehicle overtakes an EV after just two years on the road and goes on to save an average of 52 metric tonnes of pollution over its entire lifetime, around 17 years. Industrial transport lorries, they make up just 1%, for example, of the US fleet, yet accounts for 16.4 of the total emissions. Electrifying that fleet is underway very slowly, uh, and that will have an impact on emissions dramatic. Now, charging an EV and carbon emissions are contentious subjects. Many CPOs, in fact most, claim to use 100% renewable electricity. They don't. Almost all EV public charges in use today are grid connected, and no grid is 100% renewable for 100% of the time. Our UK CPOs, which claim to use 100% renewable electricity, that's achieved partially or almost entirely by using grid electricity 
partly produced by fossil fuels, and then accompanied by buying carbon offsets or credits. The electricity that comes out of the grid is not, by definition, 100% renewably generated. Solar and wind farms together with battery storage are designed to reduce that load for some of the charges we have, even take over 100% at specific limited times. Once again, it's up to Tesla to change that. The latest Tesla supercharger in California is powered 100% solar electricity, generated on site, stored in grid connected batteries, also on site. This is designed and built to operate totally off grid, 100% of the time, using locally generated 100% green energy. Now, it has got a small grid connection, about 1.5 megawatts, which is tiny for 180 um, chargers. Uh, it is present, but it's there for exporting excess electricity back into the grid and not drawing from it in times of shortage. This is the trajectory for future Tesla superchargers, all of them. However, charging an EV at present, which usually does use some grid electricity, is in fact getting cleaner anyhow. It's getting cleaner and greener as the grid evolves, while the ICE car emissions remain stubbornly constant. Safety is also an ever-present threat, and it's no surprise to find Teslas at the top of the list for vehicle safety. In fact, often scoring the highest scores ever recorded with the likes of the NCAP. And many people do not appreciate that also includes fire safety. Despite countless scare stories, Tesla cars experience 6.5 fires per billion miles driven, while ICE cars in the US catch fire 55 times per billion miles driven. Yeah. Well, it's estimated about 80% of all road accidents are in fact caused by human error, and most of them are caused by deliberate acts that directly cause the accidents. We speed up to get through that red light rather than stopping. We exceed the safe speed limit because we're in a hurry. We overtake and often misjudge the distance to the approaching car. We allow our attention to drift while we deal with talking to other passengers or, hey, sit down, deal with the children in the back. We pull out a junction, but sometimes fail to look properly, especially when it comes to motorbikes. Or we underestimate the road conditions and overestimate our driving ability to cope with it. The list is endless. DAS, Driver Assist Systems, they're designed to eliminate all of these errors. Now, not all accidents, but all of these errors. They're by reducing the majority of accidents, and this will continue to increase with future computer advances. In 2024, the average US driver covered 700,000 miles before having one accident. The average Tesla driver, using only the safety features, not autopilot or full self-drive, but safety features, covered more than 1,118,000, about 50% more, before having an accident. And using the fully autonomous features in all Teslas, allowed them to cover 6,770,000 miles. It's 10 times safer than you and I. Sad thing to admit. But the biggest impact by far has been the change in everyone and everything else running alongside Tesla. Auto manufacturers, which previously showed absolutely zero interest in EVs, now actively launch them with an increasing regularity. Last year, a total of 17 million EVs from a variety of manufacturers arrived on the world's roads. Once automakers use batteries designed for mobility vehicles or power tools for their EVs, now a whole new industry has sprung up to meet the fantastic demand that is growing rapidly. Most EV batteries in the world today are now LFP, and these don't use any cobalt or manganese or nickel that were previously sourced from you know, disreputable countries and regimes. No more children in cobalt mines in the DRC. Oh yeah, sorry. The mobile phone industry in the West, that's been in existence during those 20 years, and they still use NMC batteries. Yeah. Sorry, children, maybe they need another decade before they change. Well, in just 10 short years, EV batteries have gone from damaging, polluting and immoral and potentially unsafe from catching fire through LFP, which eliminated almost all of that. And most are now switching to sodium or aluminium. And these are far more abundant with resources, much less damaging to extract them. At the same time, it extends the life of the batteries. We're now talking about 
one or five or 10 million mile batteries. Again, unlike mobile phones, mine seems to chew through batteries incredibly fast. Well, we now have the million mile batteries and that is by no means the limit. However, even the early batteries are coming back into demand. Recycling, reusing. In 2024, 5.3 gigawatt hours of battery materials were recycled by Tesla recycling partners around the world. That's enough to make the batteries for 64,000 Model Ys. And Tesla themselves recycled a further 1.7 gigawatt hours. That's enough for 21,000 rear wheel drive Model 3s. And 590 metric tons was recycled through Giga Nevada every single month. But probably the biggest change has been seen in the national grids around the world, where previously they were all fossil fuel driven. Now that is changing. With the worldwide demand for EV batteries and the subsequent improvements in performance, safety and recycling for cars, we now have the mega packs. This is our grid connected storage. First of these on a grand scale landed in California 2019, included over 400 mega pack batteries, massive, with massive price drops in battery prices alongside tumbling solar PV prices. Tesla's gone on to install more and bigger systems worldwide. In fact, it's rapidly becoming the fastest, most profitable part of the entire company. Alongside that, Tesla launched their own solar panels. They make their own, linked to their own power walls. They make their own. These are domestic sized grid connected storage, which have the ability to link to other systems nearby and the whole thing, the neighborhood, to act as, an, as a virtual grid. These are installed in over 50,000 sites worldwide. In fact, renewable energy, grid connected storage today, offer the cheapest source of energy anywhere around the world. The old idea of peaker plants, usually coal or gas, and they were held back in reserve for providing emergency power only during those peak demand times, but at excessively ridiculous prices, that's now disappeared. Australia's a fantastic example of this. They used to be coal-fired, they're now batteries. And the once unimaginable variations in the grid caused by huge fluctuations in energy outputs from wind and solar, they've also been solved by the use of batteries. The batteries can handle the huge variations, so the grid connection from solar and wind farms are now connected into the battery, not into the grid. Grid connected batteries now stabilise the grid. Well, the transition to renewable energy has also required new production te techniques that make the process of making EVs and making batteries even more efficient, reducing overall energy demand and therefore emissions. It's incredible that Tesla Model Y now leaves the production line every 33 seconds and drives itself to the owner. Factories have also now eliminated an awful lot of waste, cut down water usage and energy consumption on a scale never before imagined. There can be nobody out there that actually honestly believes that any of this would have happened if left to the legacy auto industry. Come on, you know it or left to the various national grids around the world. Not a chance. Or left to governments. <laughs> More chance of being bitten by a lettuce. We're like a rolling stone once started. It doesn't like to stop. Momentum is gathering pace and the changes it has already brought are momentous. With the rest of the industry now catching up and in places overtaking Tesla, the future is now assured. All it took was that initial kickstart, that initial innovation. Well, thanks very much for watching. I'm Dave. If you've enjoyed this, please click the like button. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. But also please consider becoming a member. We have two memberships through Patreon or, or YouTube directly, and they offer a load of goodies that uh, non-members don't get. Uh, we produce videos that we don't ever show on, on YouTube. Uh, those are available to our members. Uh, we do behind the scenes how we film uh, some of the videos, and we also do bloopers because we don't always get it right. We also arrange meetups from time to time, so we will tell our members where we're going to be filming, where location, what day, what time, and anyone who wants to can just turn up if they want to meet me, if they want to see how we film, if they want to talk to us all. 
I usually manage to wangle a free coffee out of it. So if any of that interests you, uh, memberships start from just £1.99 a month. It really is very little money, but it makes a huge difference to us as a channel. So thanks for watching. Hope you become members. Thank you to all our existing members for your support. It's been absolutely invaluable. We don't take you for granted. I'm Dave.